so we are listening to umpteen number of predictive models it is raining actually <laughs> can i ask one question to professor chawla can you predict which predictor is going to be useful for clinical practice in uh, hcc in chronic liver disease see uh, looking at the literature the easiest would be fib4 if a fibro scan is not available freely with you but if you have both of them possibly a combination would be good but when you go through the different predictive models one of the largest group studied is gellard score unfortunately alpha fetoprotein l3 is not being done so i would say we have to validate these scores in the indian population if at all and asap where you minus alpha fetoprotein l3 may be a good alternative hello uh, this is dr ashish uh, excellent presentation all three speakers so i have uh, one question from uh, dr jose so one of the most difficult thing about uh, surveillance is adherence to surveillance we do see patients and we do advise them that keep doing ultrasound every 6 months but uh, uh, especially in india it's very difficult so how do you manage in your country uh, how do you ensure so do you keep sending them reminders every 6 months through uh, emails or uh, messages that you have to come for surveillance how adherence is ensured in uh, most of the developed countries yeah thank you for the question that uh, can you hear me okay yeah. yeah that's an excellent question i first of all let me tell you i'm not sure that we do any better in the us than we do anywhere else i mean in terms of surveillance um for hcc uh, in, in my university at least we do a few things that we try to 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 maximize one of them is patient education Uh, I do invest some time in talking to my patients and telling them how important it is to be surveyed. Um so that in patients with hepatitis B that's particularly difficult because they don't have any symptoms so they feel great. So try to convince them to come to the hospital to get a an ultrasound every 6 months is, is difficult. Uh, but I think patient education is a key factor. Uh, there are some studies done by Amit Singhal in 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 Texas where he was trying to figure out what what were the barriers for patients to get surveyed or come to screening one of the barriers is trying to um, get an appointment for an ultrasound so one thing we do in my clinic is for the patients that need an ultrasound every 6 months they leave the appointment with me with an ultrasound schedule for 6 months 3 months or whatever it is that they need to do it so in that regard i think we we do um we 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 try to push them to 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 come more often beyond that uh, some groups to call patients they uh, they send emails to patients there are all great um options and they are they actually have been shown to improve surveillance adherence but you need to have resources for that and that's a bit of a problem can i ask the next question here excuse me Yeah, hi. This is Deepika Kedia from Kolkata, Dr. Saraswat. Since you and Dr. Chavla are both in private practice now, and me being a private practitioner, I do spend a lot of time educating my patients that they do need to do alpha fetoproteins and ultrasound, and they still don't turn up. And I have records of all my patients. So, do you think it's a good idea to actually call them, or uh, like you know, and say that you are due because they don't bother coming half the time, in spite of educating them, in spite See, of spending I time. I think this is a universal problem, and all of us are facing it. Much of it, as you talked about, is the three A's: lack of awareness. we are you may be among the physicians who are aware most of the physicians in practice are not aware that they should be surveilling these patients and then there is the huge number so what i mentioned about and what now most of the scores are trying to do although universe across the board validated scores which you can apply may not yet be available but trying to follow this humongously large population of patients who are currently criteria according to criteria eligible for surveillance is actually really not doable so if you are able to concentrate on identifying the high risk group who are really at high risk of developing hcc above the numbers that i showed probably your task might be easier and you may be on stronger grounds with these numbers to convince that person that he is at high risk when the individualized approach could work so no, but would you still that. call them because if they don't turn up would you like 
like in we US so kids go ahead and call them they are when they are not coming uh, more than once or twice it is because they don't want to come and you are calling may or may not make a big difference well i mean we can certainly make the effort and call them but uh, i can't really because uh, in be private really practice people about think it. you want your fees and that is why you're doing it they don't understand the risk that is about awareness in education that's not really something we can discuss here but the patient needs to be aware and told about his risk only once he accepts that will he accept your advice for follow up and to avoid that risk just just in addition to what you asked uh, even in us the implementation of these is just 25% in india it is even worse so what i personally feel if you have the time to have a good predictive score when the patient comes to you give him the fear that you fall in the high risk category and you have to follow up maybe that may work or a digital uh, information to the patient but how much of us have the time for it huge load of patients but i think predictive models would help us in the future now oh, very interesting talks uh, my question is regarding non serotic hcc now we know that the incidence of non serotic hcc is rising especially in masled so what should be the screening strategy whether it should be etiology based or for nash it should be different for b it should be different or it's the same for all and such a huge population how do you screen for hcc and what should be the predictive models i think uh, sunil uh, what we need to do is pick up patients with the help of fib4 or fibro scan those who have a very high value who have not gone into a stage of cirrhosis maybe do a surveillance in them repeatedly no matter whether it's mafeld hcv or hbv so that means ultrasound and an alpha fetoprotein every 6 months who have advanced fibrosis is all patients so that the population is going to be huge so that population is going to be huge it whether it's cost effective or not that has to be seen i think sunil the first thing that needs to be done in the nafld non serotic masld non serotic population is within that population identify high risk groups not 100% of this population will all be at high risk of developing hcc the genetic mutations and uh, the pnpla3 and the other uh mutations that uh, predispose to hepatic steatosis might help to refine your uh, uh, search criteria and at this present point you're talking of practice i'm not talking of practice i'm talking of finding out the subset first on which you need to concentrate and then extending it to practice because currently no guidelines recommend uh, routine surveillance in non serotic masld so unless work is done first to find out which is the subset within non serotic masld that is at high risk we may not really move very much forward because you're right this is one of the largest populations in almost every country maybe dr hose has something to add to that thank you and I'm, i don't think i have a lot to add the only thing i would say is that you you ask about both and i would say hepatitis b and naf and muscle d non serotic hcc are different so i wouldn't plunge them all in the same population as both my co speakers said here we don't have enough data there are some studies showing that if you have muscle d and you have diabetes and hypertension you have a higher risk of non cirrhotic if you are hispanic you have a higher risk but i truly believe we have we don't have enough data to recommend anything right now but hopefully in the next 5 years we will yep i i had a i, I agree with jose working in the us is not a panacea we we, we do horribly also what helped in my practice is um we are quizzed patients why do you think we are doing an ultrasound every 6 months most of them had no idea despite us telling them because we assumed they knew once we introduced the c word cancer after giving them an up to date there's a translation and up to date for patient <coughs> their ability to come back for the 6 months and their investment in their care increased so if you use the cancer word often multiple times and say that they will show up or their family members will force them to show up because it's preventable cancer and that's the only thing that worked there are stern people who still will not show up and ultimately you have to realize everyone is responsible for their own health care there's only something that you can do you have to make them partners you you're not paternalistic that's the way it will work yeah uh, my question is to professor uh, jose you said the thrust of the screening for hepatitis b for hcc is to 
identify people who are at the lowest risk. In any case, you have a humongous population of hepatitis B. Most of the people are not aware that they have B. Those who are aware are not treated by the guidelines. Those you advise, they don't take treatment. And still, we are looking for that population which does not need screening. Vis a vis, if we should be looking at the people who need screening. So why the dichotomy? Yes, I, what, what I mean with that, when I talk about that is that these scores are meant to understand who's at the lowest risk. If we had any scores, any magic numbers to tell me who is at higher risk for HEC, I think we should use them for sure. But I think what we're trying to do here is try to, at least in resource-rich settings, to minimize the use of resources and money and say, okay, if you are at a very low risk of HEC, then you don't need to be screened. This is, this problem is only getting bigger, by the way, because the, the, all the studies that I show you, they are from these risk scores. A lot of them involve patients with cirrhosis. And remember, until a few years ago, cirrhosis was mainly diagnosed by clinical approach. Now that we have liver elastography, we're finding all these bar out of patients that have cirrhosis, that have absolutely no symptoms or no lab disorders, and they are possibly at risk of HEC. So, but they might not have that one to 5% per year risk that the other population has. So, so it's, it's hard to say where these scores will apply now in the era of, of liver so elastography.